Well, the Space Shuttle Columbia was having some more equipment problems today, but the astronauts were still able to carry on with their experiments. The shuttle was visible in our area with the naked eye this afternoon around 4.30. It looks pretty much like a tiny spotlight against a dark curtain, but nonetheless, Columbia was just above us for about four minutes. The next time it will pass our way will be tomorrow about 4.20 in the afternoon, but it is likely it'll be too cloudy to see it. Meantime, Roy Neal reports that the mission itself is being extended. The headlines that greeted Kennedy that sunny day in Dallas reflected a political uncertainty, but could not foretell what evening editions across the country would say. In the days that followed, Churchill would write the grieving widow about the revulsion and anger and sorrow he felt. Lonely sailors on freighters in the Pacific also wrote. So did children and the citizens of Central Falls. This special exhibit at the JFK Library is a memorial to his death. Uh, the telephone suddenly rang. We were all very good friends in the offices. And the secretary came over and said, it can't be true. And none of us could believe that it could have happened possibly. I remember the sound of the muffled drums and it seemed a symbol of the way in which people's hopes and uh, dreams had been dashed. But it was also a celebration of his life. Yeah, I think we all can learn from, from him the way he lived his life. And as a tribute to his life, the Harvard Choir sang a requiem mass. knew the library, home now to his writings and remembrances, and many of those who come today never knew the man. But as they savor the spirit still alive 20 years later, they will never forget. Beverly Shook, Newswatch 10 at the JFK Library in Boston. They're never around when you need them. I used to work around here and every time something was going on they were never around. I don't like them too much, I think. Regardless of whether that criticism is valid, it represents a problem for the Bristol Police Department. Town officials and police had agreed the department needed help to set new goals, to operate more efficiently, to improve its tarnished image. Enter one 263-page report commissioned by the town council compiled by an independent out-of-state firm. It has 84 suggestions. Among them, hire a permanent police chief as soon as possible. Divide the department into two branches, a patrol division and a support services division. Put a captain in charge of each. Improve community relations. Hire a labor lawyer to deal with the police union negotiations. Well, Town Councilor Halsey Harishoff, for one, has a lot of faith in these suggestions. Ron Moran of the Police Officers Union feels that there may be some conflicts with the union contract, but he says the report should help set the department on the right track. And I think the town is becoming more aware of some of the problems that the policemen have through this survey and through what we're saying to the town, to the people themselves. So, like I say, I think things are going to work out. I really believe they will. The report is only in draft form, and the police officers here have yet to even read it. They do agree, however, that the implementation of all these suggestions will take a lot of time and a lot of cooperation between the town, the police union, and the police chief. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10, Bristol. For lease signs, going out of business signs, they're an increasingly familiar part of the landscape in downtown Providence. And why? Where do you do most of your shopping? Down the mall, usually. Lincoln Mall. Do you ever think of doing any shopping downtown? During lunch hours and stuff, I might go, you know, pick up some small items, but for the parking and stuff like that, it's more convenient to go to the mall. Marvin Waranov opened the doors of Warren Jewelers in 1959. He says he just can't compete anymore. You know, our day is come and it's gone and you have to face up to it. You can't be unrealistic, you can't uh, live on nostalgia. It becomes too expensive. Richard Saltzman runs a watch shop downtown. He gets upset when he hears talk like that. Because the people who work downtown love downtown and they shop downtown. And our biggest problem, and no offense to you, is the media. Because they're always putting downtown down. 
This building in West Warwick once housed a men's department store. The malls brought its undoing. It's been completely renovated and reopened. Well, if the malls are getting all the business, how can this string of little shops in downtown West Warwick possibly survive? Well, here's one reason. The heavy traffic brought in by the Registry of Motor Vehicles certainly helps out the dozen businesses that have set up shop under the same roof. The people who run them say they know their customers. They special order for them. They remember their names. The merchants who've been competing successfully against the draw of the malls appear to be practicing some very basic business lessons. They may offer personalized service or add extra staffing during lunch hour. It all adds up to one thing, offering whatever it is the competition doesn't have. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10, Warwick. Finally this evening, he spent no money on any kind of a campaign, and he made no promises to his constituents. Yet he beat out six other candidates for the highest office in his community, the office of mayor. Who is he? Newswatch 10 reporter Patricia Masters explains. In the Foster suburb of Moosup Valley, just about everyone stops here at some point in the day. And the Valley store is where you're likely to run into Moosup Valley's first mayor, Earl Johnson. His limousine is not the latest model, his bodyguard is not the quickest, and his clothes are not tailor-made. But in his 85 years here, he's obviously impressed people in his own way. Earl's been here as long as the Valley's been here. He knows everything and everybody and about everything and everybody's ever done. The local newspaper, the Moosup Valley Moose, handled the election. In its November issue, it listed the seven candidates for mayor, and it urged people to vote. The moose call was heeded. Almost everyone voted for Earl. Yet he appears unimpressed with his new status. I say he's more or less of a joker. Earl remembers when the road here was a rut in the dirt, when the cement bridge replaced the wooden one. He was 40 years old when the hurricane of 38 knocked down the huge pine trees that surrounded the cemetery. I'd seen the transportation from the horse and oxen up to the uh, skate ship to the moon. We asked Earl who his favorite president had been. His response was something you don't usually hear coming from an elected official. He said, I hate politics. I've never had anything to do with it. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10, Moosip Valley. Until now. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much for joining us. NBC Nightly News coming up next. I'll be back at 11 tonight with Patrice Wood for an update. Have a good evening. suburb of Moosup Valley, just about everyone stops here at some point in the day. And the Valley store is where you're likely to run into Moosup Valley's first mayor, Earl Johnson. His limousine is not the latest model, his bodyguard is not the quickest, and his clothes are not tailor-made. But in his 85 years here, he's obviously impressed people in his own way. Earl's been here as long as the Valley's been here. He knows everything and everybody and about everything and everybody's ever done. The local newspaper, the Moosup Valley Moose, handled the election. In its November issue, it listed the seven candidates for mayor, and it urged people to vote. The Moose call was heeded. Almost everyone voted for Earl. Yet he appears unimpressed with his new status. I say he's more or less of a joker. Earl remembers when the road here was a rut in the dirt, when the cement bridge replaced the wooden one. He was 40 years old when the hurricane of 38 knocked down the huge pine trees that surrounded the cemetery. I'd seen the transportation from the horse and oxen up to the uh, skate ship to the moon. 
We asked Earl who his favorite president had been. His response was something you don't usually hear coming from an elected official. He said, I hate politics. I've never had anything to do with it. In Moosup Valley, Rhode Island, this is Patricia Masters for NBC News. This is WJAR-TV, Providence. And now, from southeastern New England's leading news station, News Watch 10, the 6 o'clock report. Good evening, I'm Kathy Ray. Well, the holidays are a time of homecomings, and today a Johnston family is celebrating the best homecoming they've ever had. Newswatch 10's Steve Gasquay is with us with that story. Steve? Well, Kathy, today Lance Corporal Michael Cavallaro came home from Lebanon. Michael was on duty in Lebanon October 23rd when 229 Marines were killed there. Back home, his family waited four days before hearing he was safe. And today they were all reunited for the first time. They were all bursting with happiness today. Michael Cavallaro's parents, fiance, brothers and sisters, and dozens of others who are related or somehow bound to the 21-year-old Marine. They couldn't keep the smiles down, or the flags, or the signs. Michael was away from home about a year when the tragedy struck, but he's back now, and the Cavalleros are happy and proud. There he is. Yeah. How do you feel right now to be back in Rhode Island? Feels great. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a long time. Michael did not want to talk about that tragic day back in October, but he said there was a lot of work to be done in the following days and weeks. It was, uh, it was pretty hectic. We had a lot of stuff to do. We were doing a lot of work. You had some anxious moments there for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I hope nobody ever has to go through again. That was really, it was hell, it really was. This will be a quick trip home for Michael Cavallaro. He has to go back to Camp Lejeune in just four days, but he says he will be back for Christmas. Steve Gasquay, News Watch 10, Green State Airport, Warwick. <laughs> Another company is closing up shop in Rhode Island and heading to South Carolina. Textron is moving its Gorham Division bronze making operation next year. The reason? Mostly to take advantage of lower shipping and electricity costs. The local steelworkers union says it means the loss of 70 of the best paying jobs in the state. The bronze workers make cemetery plaques, memorial markers, and urns. Jeff Latham will join us when we come back, and he says the mercury will dip a little more tonight. And finally tonight, as we've been telling you all week long, this is CPR Weekend in Rhode Island. It's set up to teach as many people as possible how to save a life through cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Newswatch 10 Steve Gasquay has this report. Hundreds of people came to the course at the Community College of Rhode Island this morning, and they were part of just one CPR instruction site across the state. To get the word out about CPR, the American Red Cross joined up with the American Heart Association, Channel 10, and the State Department of Health to lead people through a three-hour course that could make a lifetime of difference. The more people who know it, the more people who use it when a person has a life-threatening emergency, then the more chance that person has of living between the time they have a heart attack and the time they get to the hospital. Anybody can come in here and in three hours we can give you enough CPR to where you could possibly go out and save a life. The CPR course attracted people from all different walks of life and people with different reasons for learning it. Some people had already taken a CPR course but they wanted to get brushed up on the technique. Other people had never taken CPR and they wanted to learn just how to save a life. Other people had an even more special reason for learning CPR. Among them, the Vieiras of Cranston. An Easter party at the Vieiras home was the scene of a tragedy. A good friend came to the party suffered a heart attack and died. If somebody qualified had been there at the time and done it right from the beginning, and, you know, maybe Lenny wouldn't have died. You know, maybe we could have saved him. 
everybody had panicked. And uh, I guess he went through cardiac arrest. And by the time the rescue came, which was about close to 15 minutes later, I guess by the time he got to the hospital, it was just a little bit too late. The Vieira said they could have been out Christmas shopping today. But they said learning CPR is the best Christmas present they could give each other. If, if something happened to either of us, we'd know what to do. You can have a million dollars and it can go. But if you can help somebody, that'll last forever in your memory. And there's still one day left to learn this precious gift. CPR weekend continues tomorrow at CCRI and across the state. Steve Gasquay, News Watch 10, Warwick. And that's it for the early edition of the News Watch. We thank you for joining us. Nightly News is next, and we'll be back at 11 when the News Watch continues. Until then, have a nice evening. started out with 13 couples vowing to dance the night away and the morning and most of the afternoon. After 20 hours, five couples were still at it. Yes, an old-fashioned dance marathon, the fifth annual one to raise money for the school's a cappella choir. The goal, $4,300 to send the choir on a tour in Sweden. A worthy goal, unfortunately, some contestants ran out of gas. Others seem to be running on high test. Aren't you tired? Ah. You can get, forever. Gonna make it to the end? Huh? Gonna make it to the end? I, I could do two of these. No, they're easy, yeah. I'm not tired. My feet are hurting me a little bit, though. Gonna make it to the end? Yes, of course. I did it last year, so it was great. Four hours to go. And it was over. The goal accomplished. Until next year. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10, Cranston. The moment came Saturday in Oslo, Norway. Danuta Walensa accepted the Nobel Prize on behalf of her husband, Lech. He chose not to leave Poland for fear he would not be allowed to return. In celebration, a special mass for solidarity was held at St. Aldebert's Church in Providence. Although the Polish government outlawed solidarity two years ago, it still maintains a two million person membership in Poland and a strong support base worldwide. Solidarity support groups, political allies, and union peers also met in Providence. They agreed that receiving the Nobel Prize helps the cause of solidarity, but that much work remains. From Solidarity International, Andrzej Blaszynski. The real success of solidarity really is, should be measured and should be looked for uh, you know, at the uh, shop floor and you know, on the factory level. Uh, things that happen outside are, are obviously important because they do, you know, tend to support people morally. Uh, and certainly the Pope's visit was a significant boost as well. Uh, but uh, ultimately the effects of all that really will be measured with the common, common person. Uh, and, and as far as we can tell, and, and we have uh, significant information coming from, from Poland, uh, this is a success. As one speaker put it, the award of the Peace Prize to Alenza represents the superiority of the human spirit over those who would deny humanity. Steve Gasquay, Newswatch 10.
It requires some money, a bit of planning, and a lot of elbow grease. But that didn't stop 40 Providence families last year from becoming first-time homeowners. And starting today, people looking for homes through the Providence Swap program will have a wider range of options. Swap stands for Stop Wasting Abandoned Property. And in furthering that goal today, it announced a change in its program. Formerly, a family considering buying a house, such as this one on Sackett Street, would get a grant from Swap for $4,500. The amount of the grant was the same, regardless of house size or state of repair. But today, a flexible grant system was implemented, whereby the grant will be based on a house's estimated repair cost. What we hope will happen is, is that this will enable homesteaders to do houses that are more severely damaged than our average house. Swap is currently offering about 50 houses for sale to qualified buyers. The excitement among those benefiting from the growth of the new car industry is not shared by all area residents. That's because a lot of them, frankly, can't afford a new car. But as Newswatch 10's Patricia Masters tells us, that situation means money to some area business owners. It's the first shift at the Providence branch of the Fram Corporation. Before the day is over, workers will have churned out about 100,000 air and oil filters. Unit sales have gone up about 8% every year since 1979, and 1984 is expected to be even better. Fred McCarthy has been a mechanic for about 18 years. He says people are not buying new cars as often as they used to. Instead, they're spending between $1 and $200 a year on regular maintenance to keep Old Faithful on the road another year. They'll spend it rather than go out and spend $10,000 on a new car. This auto part retail store is thriving too. 31 stores have been opened in the last eight years. People are now keeping their cars an average of seven years, and they're learning to fix it themselves. Because you can buy a house for what you pay for a new car now. If you can afford to go buy a new car, do it, because it's nice to have. But if you can't do it, you stick with what you got. The people who make money off used car parts are all for new cars. Obviously, all of them will one day be old cars. The electronic age has made possible a lot of fancy new car features, right on up to a car that talks to you. But all these new features make car repair more complicated and more expensive. So except for the occasional oil change or filter change, experts say the new cars could make do-it-yourself repair obsolete. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10. It's the first shift at the Providence branch of the Fram Corporation. Before the day is over, workers will have churned out about 100,000 air and oil filters. Unit sales have gone up about 8% every year since 1979, and 1984 is expected to be even better. Fred McCarthy has been a mechanic for about 18 years. He says people are not buying new cars as often as they used to. Instead, they're spending between $1 and $200 a year on regular maintenance to keep Old Faithful on the road another year. They'll spend it rather than go out and spend $10,000 on a new car. This auto part retail store is thriving too. 31 stores have been opened in the last eight years. People are now keeping their cars an average of seven years, and they're learning to fix it themselves. Because you can buy a house for what you pay for a new car now. You can afford to go buy a new car, do it, because it's nice to have. But if you can do it, you stick with what you got. The people who make money off used car parts are all for new cars. Obviously, all of them will one day be old cars. The electronic age has made possible a lot of fancy new car features, right on up to a car that talks to you. But all these new features make car repair more complicated and more expensive. So except for the occasional oil change or filter change, experts say the new cars could make do-it-yourself repair obsolete. Patricia Masters, Newswatch 10. It had started off as such a happy day for Beverly Sutton and her sister Marion Peters. They had just made the last layaway payment on Christmas presents for their children and put the gifts in the trunk of Marion's car. But while they were food shopping, a thief ripped out the back seat and stole the presents. 
I spotted her back seat. I said, we're getting in the wrong car, her seats. Well, like, like that. Then I, I said, Marion, they've gone through your trunk. We opened the trunk and the boxes were there, but they just ripped everything out of the boxes. I panicked, you know, I screamed and, you know, yelled and everything. I was just, because there was nothing I could do at that point about it. It was just gone, the stuff was gone. They had been paying for the gifts since October, and since then they had told their friends in the Riverside Grill about the clothes and cassettes they were giving their kids. Now they told them all the presents worth $250 were stolen. That's when the Christmas spirit came to this little diner. The fellows who work here, Jim LaForge, Frank Shea, Peter Rukas, and his father John, put the word out. We didn't think nothing of it at first because it happened, you know. And then we decided she was not going to be able to get any more, you know, gifts for Christmas and uh, for the children and whatnot. So the boys decided to take up collection for her. One of those who donated was Howard Burton, who eats at the Riverside Grill twice a day. Well, I think you'd hate like heck to be in the same position, you know. Uh, the boys did it, you know, they're the fellas who put it together, and it's, it's pretty hard to refuse. One by one, the customers and employees dipped into their pockets, and in less than 12 hours, collected all the money the sisters needed to replace the gifts. Yesterday I was at work, and Frank Shea called me up and wanted to see me immediately. So I came right out of where I came down, and they handed me the $250 to replace everything. How did you feel? Oh, I, was, I, I, I just ran out because I was, you know, going to cry and bawl and everything. So I just ran out. <laughs> These are friends you can really count on, aren't they? Right. They really pull through when you need them. You know, there's still people out there that will help, you know, and that proves it. What's that say about the Christmas spirit? They sure have it, the good old Riverside customers. Yes, they do. I think everybody's glad they could do it. <laughs> Steve Gasquay, Newswatch 10, East Providence. <laughs> Members of the General Assembly say they're setting an example for other state departments. The current budget for the State House is $6,660,701. The proposed budget for next year is $6,653,779. The savings amounts to $6,922, or about 0.1%. House Speaker Matthew Smith and Senate Majority Leader John Revens Jr. said although the savings is a small one, it is a first. We made a very conscious effort. There are six new course centers that have been developed over the past two years to uh, monitor on a weekly basis what's being spent. And this was no fluke. Actually, the requests from the various departments within the legislature for uh, spending uh, were uh, much higher uh, than we approved, but uh, we asked all the departments to scale down their requests. The cuts came about in outside legal services, fewer hours for some part-time employees keeping vacancies vacant, and printing costs, due to a new printing system, are lower. The entire state budget is over $900 million. Legislative leaders hope their cost savings example, along with the recommended 5.5% state spending cap, will result in the state operating as economically as possible. Legislative leaders won't predict whether or not the new no-growth budget represents a trend, but they do see another trend developing, one of cooperation both between the House and the Senate, and between the Democrats and Republicans in the State House. Steve Gasquay, Newswatch 10, Providence. This is the result of all that rainfall. The state's water system is close to capacity. The chief engineer of the Providence Water Supply Board Wiley Archer. Well, I think we've had uh, significant rain, even though it has come in bursts as opposed to being spread out through the year. And in addition, our consumption is down uh, somewhat from previous years. Taking a look around the state, Bristol County. Water supplies up to 84.4%, just about normal. Newport County, 86% capacity. That's above normal. Pawtucket is way up, about 98%. And Kent County is up most of all, 100% capacity, 
Officials there consider that highly unusual. All positive indications for a state which has been touched by water shortages in recent years. We are above what we had last year at this time. Um, a few years back, we are roughly uh, a little bit ahead of our 50-year average for the elevation in the reservoir. And as far as the drought situation is concerned, in our particular system, we have a very large reservoir and, and we have great buffering capacity that other systems don't have. Archer said the Situate Reservoir is nearly 90% capacity. When full, it holds 41 billion gallons, enough to provide water to 450,000 customers in Rhode Island for two years, even if there wasn't any rain. Steve Gasway, Newswatch 10. Plenty of water in Shannock. The Pocketuck River runs through the village, pouring over falls and through old mill runways. Plenty to look at, but little to drink. The 100 families living here have been warned Shannock's tap water is contaminated. The same heavy rains which made the Horseshoe Fall spill loudly caused groundwater to get into Shannock's well. The bacteria that we found there is called coliform organisms. And the presence of these organisms does not necessarily indicates sewage pollution. Uh, it simply is a warning that the water is not what it should be, the quality has some imperfections in it, and as a precautionary measure, it should not be consumed. The people here were notified by word of mouth and posted warnings to boil the water before drinking it. Some people here are worried, some aren't. I'm drinking it, you know, it's you know, not bothering me at all. I'm not getting sick or nothing. It's not going to bother me too much. Yeah. You just get it fixed up whenever you get it fixed up? Yeah, they don't know when. They don't know when? No. The health department ordered the company which owns and is developing Shannock to isolate the well system from groundwater runoff. They say they've complied. Well, we started uh, analyzing the situation yesterday, and as of today, they've begun to work on it. We hope to have it fixed probably by late today or tomorrow. Once the repairs have been completed and approved by the Department of Health, there's only one thing left to do. That's dump about two pints of chlorine into the water system here. The Department of Health says that should get rid of any lingering amounts of coliform bacteria. Steve Gasquay, Newswatch 10, Shannock. The Rhode Island Community Food Bank in Providence receives thousands of pounds of food from area supermarkets. It distributes the food to agencies that feed the poor. National Care and Share Day is supposed to help agencies like this. President Reagan says local businesses and citizens are to donate food for the hungry and the poor. That would have made this a very busy day for the food bank. Haven't seen any of it, haven't heard anything officially from uh, any of the other people involved. Uh, nothing from the White House, nothing from uh, any of the other charities that are supposed to be involved nothing from the service organizations that are supposed to do the pickup, and even the uh, grocery chains know nothing about it. Local supermarkets like Stop and Shop were to set up bins in their stores for a collection of the food. Stop and Shop just heard of the plan last Thursday, too late to set up anything. The food was to be brought here from local stores by civic groups, including the Lions Club, the Jaycees, and Kiwanis. The regional head of the Lions Club said he was informed of the plan on Saturday, but that was far too late for him to take any action. The planning seems to have taken place over the last few days, uh, put together in a hurry, and unfortunately, you can't do a really successful food drive in just a few days. I think in the long run it could be detrimental because people can see, would see that nothing comes out of these food drives and it may make people not want to participate in food drives in the future. Tim Carr, Newswatch 10, Providence. Hey, 
found. For when they placed it on his head, he began to dance around. Oh, Frosty the snowman was alive as he could be. And the children say he could laugh and play just the same as you and me. Thumpity thump, thump, thumpity thump, thump, look at Frosty go. Thumpity thump, thump, thumpity thump, thump, over the hills of snow. Frosty the snowman knew the sun was hot that day. So he said, let's run and we'll have some fun now before I melt away. Down to the village with a broomstick in his hand. Cut it here and there all around the square, saying, catch me if you can. He led them down the streets of town right to the traffic cop. And he only paused a moment when he heard him holler, stop! Oh, Frosty the snowman had a hurry on his way But he waved goodbye saying, don't you cry, I'll be back again someday Thumpity thump, thump, thumpity thump, thump, look at Frosty go Thumpity thump, thump, thumpity thump, thump, over the hills of snow Okay, another three, two, three, two, <laughs> you fucking guy. Why? Why do I have it? All right, three. You rolling? Yeah. Three, two. One of the sailors aboard this Coast Guard boat said this whale reminded him of a girl he once knew, Fifi. Says the odor is quite similar. Therefore, the Coast Guard has nicknamed this whale, Fifi. Steve Gasquay, Newswatch 10 aboard Coast Guard Cutter 41482 in the ocean. You know, even with all our charts and weather instruments, we can't tell you yet what the coming winter is going to be like, but we can show you a few of the things to look for. Hey, Jack, who gives a fuck what, the, what, uh, what we're looking for? All right, would you get out of the shot, please? We don't want to fuck this up completely. Hey, uh, Jeff Latham is a, is a very short timer here. And, uh, Talk about short time, or this is your first and last job, pal. Oh. So the pressure is on for the state agencies and for the Duffy and Shanley Advertising Agency, too. After all of this effort, if the voters reject the Greenhouse Compact, not only will a lot of work go down the drain, but a lot of good Democrats who are waiting for cushy state jobs see their careers and their state pensions go right out the fucking window. Frank Coletta, Newswatch 10, Providence. <laughs> Come back dead. O over, over Don't here, forget it. Calling. The Marine Corps told you that. Remember that. Hey, listen to me. I don't listen to you. I've heard enough of you already. I'm telling you. Uh, I'm telling these young people. It's yeah. my show, yeah. and if you don't knock it off, I'm yeah. throwing you off personally. Have so? you hear that, Marine uh, buddy? Uh, yeah. All right. Listen. America is still number one, Pompeii. Now, the first time we try to fly across the ocean, we get halfway back and we run out of gasoline and we got to go back. Next time we take more gas, 
we get almost all the way to America, maybe three feet. When what do you think? We run out of gasoline again and we gotta go back. Next time we take plenty gas, but what do you think? We forget the aeroplane. Then I think of something very smart. We not take a gasoline, we not take an aeroplane. We take a steamship, and that is how we fly across the ocean. Now that we've wasted that much tape, we can uh, get the work done, I think, right? You know Jim Martin? Yeah, I know him. What do you know about Jim? Oh, he go fight up. Every time they get hurt, every time they win the fight, and they lose all the fight, they lose all the fight, they lose. Uh, have you ever and, seen him fight before? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the old time, the, the old, old time. Uh-huh. And there's no fight, they said they're no good. They are like a lot of fight they are. He said, well, I'm going to fight out there to win a better man. Well, have you ever talked to Jim Martin? Yeah. What's he told you? Well, he said, I had to fight. I said, oh, the all right. The fight is all right. How do you have to fight to work? Uh-huh. Fight is all right. How many fights have, has he had? Nine. Nine? Has he won them all? Uh, every one of them. Who was his best opponent? I don't know. He's a manager they got. He got his manager. He's all good. You ever heard of a guy named Frank Coletta? You know Nancy? Who? Nancy. Nancy? The man. The man? Yeah. He's in, he's in trouble, boy. He's in you, mean, trouble. you mean Buddy Nancy? No, he's in trouble. Why is he in trouble? He beat his wife. He beat his wife. He did what? He beat his wife. Yeah? Yeah. Was he in court? What? Okay. Let's be take number one. Excuse me while I blow gas. Oof. What? <laughs> You're upwind. You have nothing to worry about. All right, one, three. Oh, that Blue Miser sure would keep his nose busy around here. Hi, I'm Mark Weil. And also tonight on PM Magazine, we're going to take you to a computerized dairy farm where they milk the cows completely by computer. In our PM departments, Chef Tell's putting the finishing touches on that vegetable platter that he made for us last night. Uh, Dr. Constantine has a health tip. And Darcy Lubart's taking us to a computerized automatic center. We'll get to all that in a little bit, but first, <laughs> let's go back to Sheila. <laughs> hey, you know what? That cow sniffed your crotch in this room. It's so good. Hey, yeah. Uh... so good. <laughs> I've heard people say I do a shitty job, but this is ridiculous. Hey, come back! I'm sorry! Treat yourself to the convenience and variety of hair styling. Eva Gabor wigs are now just $14.99 to $24.99 at all Miller and Road stores. Be there on 11 Alive. Be there on Channel 16. Be there on Q6. Be there on 20. Be there on TV 22. Be there on KY3. Be there on Channel 4. Who wrote this shit? <laughs> Providence police say the suspect was upset because he got a double order of anchovies on a pizza when all he wanted was plain cheese. Newswatch 10, Steve Gasquay is that supposed subject. Here behind me, you can see all the little guidos hanging around. All they want to do is be on TV, the mother <laughs> Bart Noon in Little Italy. You know, even with all our maps and our weather instruments, we can't tell you what the coming winter's gonna be like, but we can show you a few of the things to look for. This is typical. When you do a I know. I knew this was gonna happen. All right, let's try it again. The cold weather will be bringing in <laughs> the condensed balls. Get and the, in. the high pressure system will be causing a lot of snow in energy. Uh, You're not waving your arms in there. Uh, the, let me get a jacket. It's no, three no, no, sizes too go. small. Yeah, you go. Full <laughs> something like this. It was a little bit. You ever see the day he almost fell off the set? Oh, I like these. These are new e these new ECMs, yeah. Too foxy. You ever hear about the day he almost fell off the, the set? Fuck out of here. What's your New Year's resolution? Uh, to father Woody Allen's child. What's your name? Denise McCroy. What's your phone number? <laughs> Eight two eight one seven two five. Do anything Friday night? <laughs> this. No, yeah, next. No. Okay, sorry, I'm busy though. <laughs> the other thing that I that I feel compelled to say is that, uh, with respect to the second coma, there is absolutely no evidence in the record that Dr. Cahill's opinion on the second coma is in any way dependent upon his opinion on the first coma. 
today were based upon two separate and distinct occurrences and the test findings relating to each coma were separate and distinct. And so far as, as, as defense counsel's representation that the second hypothetical question begged the question because I included in the question the fact uh, that it was a, a, uh, a uh, with respect to the oh second boy. coma. That's no Stephen. That mm -hmm. Dr. Cahill's opinion on the second He's coma got is in such a nice ass. The first coma. They were based upon two separate and distinct occurrences. <coughs> and the oh, boy, no, that, uh, uh, Stephen uh, is a really fine lawyer, but so what an ass. As defense counsel's representation that the second hypothetical question. God, the question this I guy. The question He's putting me in a coma. That it was a a uh, a. When someone gets blue, Ooh, Yeti, it's and great. Is that a bump? response was not, yes, in my opinion. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. C could I ask you, could you step over here for our Newswatch cameras and tell us exactly what it is you're doing? Well, uh, I've got a new type of hedge trimmer. It's, uh, it's a very effective little thing, and... Uh, and these were sticking out of your head, so I put the two to good use. That's the Runko Pocket Hedge Trimmer. <laughs> you know Larry Estepa? Well, now, Mr. Young, know, is he the young... Is he supposed to be the hot throb I heard of Channel Ted? Mm. Oh, yes, I heard about him. What are you going to be bringing him for Christmas? Uh, a new baby for his family. Don't That'll you be think a surprise so? to his wife? Yeah, I imagine it will be, but it's always a good surprise. Uh, what did you want for Christmas? Uh, nothing special, Sam. Between you and me, how about a pay raise? No, because that, what that really, you don't say this on the air, but what that really implies, let's say that there's a puddle of herpes sitting there. It really implies that someone has to have his penis or her vagina on that site in a, in a, <laughs> and mechanically irritate it to spread, in, huh? to spread the stuff in. You know, that's what yeah. happens during the intercourse, okay? That's not going to happen. Oh. Imagination. Oh. And he writes it really very well. In and now, a News Watch 10 update. Good evening. I was just sucking down a coffee bun and didn't time it awfully well. <laughs> Some of it is still stuck to the roof of my mouth. And uh, I'm sorry, what else can I say, you know? I posed the question to a doctor once uh, about uh, one's sex life being impeded by taking certain medications. His answer was, um, either you uh, have high blood pressure and an active sex life or uh, just the opposite. Well, fortunately, the, the new medications now allow you to have your cake in and to eat it too. Poor choice of words, doctor, but uh, let's go on to the next thing. Some of it is still stuck to the roof of my mouth. And uh, I'm sorry, what else can I say, you know? problems that will concern the Civic Association will be zoning laws and group housing. September 13th, the association meets with Assemblyman Gary Lee in hopes of getting flood relief money for damages. This is Frank Carpano reporting. Have been busy. Yeah, is every day as hectic as today was? Because I know we tried to get you and get you and oh, get you. Oh, no. <laughs> You're always running around like this? I thought it was firecrackers. You know, I'm bang, bang. I thought, I thought it was firecrackers, really. Then, and then now all of a sudden you went in the back room, then I see him dead there with the blood coming down there. I said, oh, gee. I went back there, baby. I was well, sick right now. What did you see happen? Because I seen him take the gun out and shoot at him. The gun, he took the gun, and, you know, and went up in the air somewhere. Oh, in the ceiling or what? So he dragged the kid back there. You know, I'm so nervous. I'm
members of the Army Reserve came loaded down with Hasbro toys to the Tavares Center for children with multiple handicaps. Most of these children have been confined to wheelchairs or beds their whole lives and have never been to a Christmas party. But their eyes sparkled when the man with the long white beard came dancing through. Merry Christmas! <laughs> presents for everyone, the Tavares Center children, their brothers and sisters, and children of the employees here. Look what you got! Many of these children can do little more than sit and stare. However, when the music started, they did their best to dance. You dancing? The spirit of Santa Claus is real. He doesn't have to have a pot belly, a red suit, or a beard to be authentic. Newswatch 10 reporter Kathy Ray took to the sky or looked to the sky today, and here's what she saw. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Santa Claus is making most of his stops tomorrow night. So while Rudolph and his team rest up, we were able to catch up with a Santa on special duty today, where sleigh rudders magically turned into rotors. Old St. Nick is coming to town, but what about folks who don't live in town, whose town happens to be stuck smack dab in the middle of the ocean? Enter Russ Johnson, a pilot who, along with East Coast Helicopter, has volunteered his time to haul Christmas cargo. The gifts, courtesy of the Howe Lighthouse Museum, are dropped off to people who man the lighthouses. Russ says he's carrying on a tradition. This is a tradition that Bill Snow, an old pilot, started in Massachusetts about 35 years ago. Bill died about three years ago and we picked it up and we're going to continue. What Bill used to do was drop the packages out of an airplane to all the manned lighthouses. And to carry on Bill's tradition, we're going to do it God knows for how long, as long as we can. Russ's slick sleigh made two stops today. First, at the Warwick Light Station. Now Santa actually made out pretty well himself on this stuff, as did this reporter and photographer Jim Capillo. The next toy drop, Block Island. A handful of children greeted Santa and then couldn't yeah. wait to tear into the goodies. Yeah, uh, then, with a twinkle in his eye, our Santa buckled into his sleigh, bidding happy holidays, and made his way into the sky. After all, He's got a long day ahead of him tomorrow. Kathy Ray, Newswatch 10. If such a law existed, it might read, generosity is inversely proportionate to the number of shopping days left till Christmas. In other words, the shops were packed on Christmas Eve. And they're buying exactly what they want. If they want a leather today, they're looking at it, especially the men, and they're taking it. And, and they're happy with it. One man counted out $125 in quarters just to buy his wife a diamond pendant. I think that was the weirdest story we'd have to tell here for this season. <laughs> it was really something. Of course, we all know the right way to do your Christmas shopping. You start early in September or October, and every time you see a gift a loved one might like, you get it then. But of course, there are a lot of people who don't do things the right way. I'm doing all my shopping today. You're doing all your Christmas shopping today? Yeah. Why'd you wait so long? I don't know. <laughs> did all your Definitely. Christmas shopping today? Yes, I did, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm worse than normal. Why'd you wait so long? <laughs> um, just procrastination, school, uh, work, everything just built up. Hey, I didn't have money. I saw my car, now I got the box, so I'm buying the presents. <laughs> And of course, the belated holiday spirit is fine with the retailers. It's jam-packed. Mm-hmm. This is good. Last-minute shop is... All day since 9 o'clock. 9 a.m. it's been like this all day. We haven't had a rest. Yeah, it's just what they're doing, just picking up little things here and there. And, you know, last things, last-minute things. Charity, too, benefited. 
Getting presents wrapped at the Hadassah display meant donating to medical research in Israel. We wish we could be here longer to um, accommodate everybody. However, we have been here since last Friday and we are exhausted. Well, just as sure as Santa's about to come down your chimney, it's just about too late to do any more Christmas shopping. But with hopes that all yours is done, I'm Steve Gashway, Newswatch 10, Warwick. <laughs>